Good afternoon, everyone. Got a light crowd here. Hopefully, we've got a bunch of you following along online. Good to see everyone. I've got a little spot here from where I, you know, had the direct brain plug to download all the information. You're gonna wish you had one too. In about, uh, you know, over the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, no, seriously, I I had a little cyst removed. Uh, went really well, so. No problem. I've actually been very amazed at how little it hurts. It just itches a little bit, and I say, you know, it's like the liquid stitches are supposed to disintegrate in about three or four days. All right, so uh, I know, well, most of our snow is, has melted now after all the rain we've gotten uh, over overnight. And I know that the snow is not some people's cup of tea, but I've always really liked the, the winter because of the snow. Um, of course, you know, I like that part about this time of year, but uh, what I dislike is, you know, going to the store and all the music you got to hear. Uh, historically speaking, the, the festival that marks this time of year, what we know as Christmas, is interesting. Uh, not because it's Christian, uh, but because I was thinking, you know, if, if you had a time machine and you could go back... 2,000 years ago to ancient Rome, or 3,000 years ago to Egypt, or 4,000 years ago to Babylon, and you pluck someone off the street, and you set them right down here on Fairhaven, you go a couple blocks that way, and there's that giant decorated tree, and they'd say, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's for, um, that's for Saturn, or that's for the son of the queen of heaven, or that's uh, for Nimrod, or whatever they would know them as. Uh, I'm sure they would, it wouldn't take them long to realize what it was. Um, and the same goes for another idea that's kind of been added on into uh, the Christian world, which is the idea of the Trinity. Because that goes back thousands of years before Christ as well, whether an Egyptian would tell you, yeah, that's Amun Ra and Ta, or a uh, Hindu would say that's, um, that's Krishna, Vishnu, and uh, Shiva. Or maybe the Greeks, who are a little bit more philosophically inclined, they would say, yes, it's the, mind, or it's the source, the mind, and the spirit. That makes the trinity. This idea, which has been held by most uh, professing Christians for about 1,500 years or more now, would, have all, would also be recognizable to our ancient time traveler that we plucked off the street from, you know, Babylon 4,000 years ago. Um, of course, like I said, those things were added later on, and try as you might, you will not find them in the pages of your Bible. That is, you know, Christ did not teach that to his followers, the apostles never taught that to, to the early church. And from the writings we have and the practices that we see in the early church, none of these things existed uh, within the church community back then. So because you know Christmas is, is tomorrow on the calendar, and uh, John spoke about uh, the nature, you know, the relationship between uh, the Father and Christ, and Mr. Slocum's supposed to be doing this Bible study as soon as the weather can be good and he can make it up here and all that sort of stuff. I wanted to go over just not so much biblical evidence, but historically speaking, from historical records and such, uh, about the mountain of evidence as to how we know that these are pagan intrusions and things that came into Christianity. So if you want to go ahead and put up that title slide, um, if you want a, uh, a title, I'm just calling it, you know, Paganism into Christianity. And we're going to talk about Christmas and we're going to talk about the Trinity. All right. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, there are a ton of sources a lot of these, though not all of them, some of these books I've read independently, a lot of these things are, can be found in the church literature, the, the booklets, you know, on Christmas and on the Trinity and, and stuff like that. And I, it, it is a lot of things, as you can see, um, a lot of different sources. If you want, 
I'm going to be reading a lot today. Uh, so if you have flashbacks to when you were at school and you you know you need to get a breath, you know, go and have your panic attack out there. Um, <laughs> No, but seriously, if you want, I have like a Word document with a table of contents and you can all that sort of stuff from everything I'm about to say. And just let me know and I can email that to you. All right. Um, before we're going to start that, though, I do want to read just a couple scriptures uh, from the New Testament that show that the even the apostles, like they knew that things like this were going to happen. They were forewarned. And like we just heard, you know, forewarned is forearmed. So let's go to uh, the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts 20, starting in verse 28. This is where Paul is uh, speaking to the elders here, and he's saying, again, this is Acts 20, 28 through 31. He's saying, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which you uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my, departure, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you, or to warn everyone, night and day with tears." So this was inevitable. This was always going to happen. The apostles knew it. Christ knew it. God the Father knew it. And we know it, okay? Uh, also, uh, writing several decades later, if you want to turn to 1 John chapter 2, John is writing, um, like I said, several decades later. The, that was the book of Acts that, that took place uh, probably like in the 40s AD or something. Uh, we're going to go to John, which is probably written in like the 80s or 90s. 1 John 2.18. 1 John 2.18, where John is writing to the church. He says, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. So the process had already started. By which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they, might be that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and that no, li no lie is of the truth. And if you skip down to verse 24, Therefore let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. So this is what I want you to keep in mind. What uh, uh, He continues on, if you heard, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and the Father. So, the original doctrine that is in your Bible, what they were being taught, what they were taught by Christ, what they were taught by the apostles, what the early church did, that's the baseline. And anything else that's been layered on over top of it needs to be scraped away. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's look at what some historians have said about the period immediately following the writing of the bulk of the New Testament. Here's from the book, The Story of the Christian Church. It says, we name the last generation of the first century from about 68 to 70 AD, the age of shadows, partly because the gloom of persecution was over the church, but more especially because of all the periods in the church's history, it is the one about which we know the least. We have no longer the clear light of the book of Acts to guide us, and no author of that age has filled the blank in the history. For 50 years after St. Paul's life, a curtain hangs over the church through which we strive vainly to look, and when at last it rises, about 120 AD, with the writings of the earliest church fathers, we find a church in many aspects very different from that in the days of St. Peter and St. Paul. All right, so if you want to put the timeline up, we'll be hitting each one of these things as we move along. After this so-called Age of Shadows, Christianity you know, is spread through the empire, through the Roman world, but it becomes uh, what we would say is like, you know, it's the Wild West. 
anything goes, there's no central power, uh, there's no one checking in to make sure doctrines and practices match up from one city, one region to the next. And so things slowly begin to develop over time. They lose some things, they gain some things. Um, and sometimes you, you read in the sources, there are even multiple churches in the same city who are teaching different doctrines. You know, it's kind of like, well, there's the First Baptist Church and there's the Free Will Baptist Church and they're right on the corners up looking at each other, like in my hometown where I grew up. Um, anyway, from the book, The Early Years of Christianity, The Martyrs and Apologists, quote, this was a period which allowed large latitude to Christian thought and clung tenaciously only to the foundations of the faith. Arrhenius, one of the so-called church fathers, contents himself with affirming in general terms the fall forgiveness, the unity of the two testaments, the calling of the Gentiles, the incarnation, and the resurrection. Everything else up for grabs. Going on, he says, the divergence, the divergencies of view among these early church fathers do not reach positive opposition, but there are nevertheless very distinct shades of doctrine variously coloring the faith in Christ, which is held in common by all. From the book, Lost Christianities, he says, scholarship has tended to show early Christianity was even less tidy and more diversified than realized. As a result of ongoing scholarship, it is widely thought today that proto-Orthodoxy was simply one of the many competing interpretations of Christianity in the early church. So if you think there's, you know, dozens of de denominations now, well, there kind of always have been. The, the truth have, has always been, you know, the narrow path, like, like Jesus said. Again, this is from the book, The Early Years of Christianity. The oral tradition, and he's going to tell us why, why all the different things. He says, oral tradition, which is people's customs that they already have, is a sort of universal suffrage which will, in the end, make its will paramount and gain the sanction of the official authorities. Hence, imagining fake miracles designed to establish the divine origin of the new religion, hence false teachers who are under strong temptation to put in circulation a host of apocryphal scriptures. So that's why you have all these, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of, of Peter, the, like all these other things that aren't part of the Bible. More and more importance came to be attached to the outward rites. Baptism was identified with pagan washings. Language used to, in reference to the Lord's Supper gave authority to every superstition. Finally, men began to people this sort of Christian Olympus in which the creature would soon find a niche for self-worship and the Virgin Mother was already placed on its highest summit. So this is like all the saints and the martyrs, you know, and they're starting to worship them. Also, he goes on to specifically to say that in the second and third centuries, the first day of the week was freely substituted for the Sabbath to meet the necessities of worship and the great Jewish feasts were replaced by the Christian festivals. So this, like I said, it's like the Wild West. Anything goes. If you want to be part of the straight and narrow, you're going to find a smaller and smaller and smaller group of people who are willing to stick to the truth once taught. And this process of addition and replacement was slower in some places and it was faster in other places. It seems like in uh, Asia Minor, uh, like the churches that are mentioned in Revelation that had direct ties to, the, to John the Apostle, it took them a little bit longer to lose the truth. Places further off, like Rome, they seem to adopt more of these pagan things. Uh, places like Greece and Egypt, they were much into you know, philosophy. So they started getting other strange ideas. And in each region, it was kind of different. It was its own thing. All right, uh, here's from a book called, and this is one of my favorite ones, it's called, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? He says, few occasions were more attractive to the common people of Rome than feasts. One of the customs of the early church congregations had been to remember their local martyrs by having a memorial service on the anniversary of the martyr's death. Some innovative Christians realized they could attract non-believers to the church by expanding these martyrs' feasts into festive public celebrations. The idea worked beautifully, and soon entire towns were converted this way. Once the church opened itself to change, how could it know whether God approved the changes? She thought the answer was easy, mistakenly thinking that growth automatically indicates God's approval. 
Having accepted this premise, the church quickly adopted virtually any practice that resulted in growth, including the use of images in worship, a practice utterly loathsome to the early Christians. Here's from the book, The Two Babylons, which says, Long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen. At that precise time of the year, in honor of the birth of the son of the, ba of the Babylonian queen of heaven, and it may, be fair, or it may fairly be presumed that in order to conciliate the heathen and to swell the number of the nominal adherents of Christianity, the same festival was adopted by the Roman church, giving it only the name of Christ. This tendency on the part of Christians to meet paganism halfway was very early developed, and we find Tertullian, even in his day, about the year 230. So this is... Um, almost you know, a, couple hundred years, a couple hundred years after Christ has died. And he's bitterly lamenting the inconsistency of the disciples of Christ in this respect by contrasting it with the strict fidelity of the pagans to their superstitions. Quote, By us, he says, who are strangers to Sabbaths, the new moons, and festivals, so they'd already d dropped doing that. Once acceptable to God, the Saturnalia, the Feast of January, the Bramalia, the Matronalia, are now frequented, Gifts are carried to and fro. New Year's Day presents are made with din, and sports and banquets are celebrated with uproar. Oh, how much more faithful are the heathen to their religion, who take special care to adopt no solemnity from the Christians. So they are not going to let the Christians stop their party. And he finishes by saying, Upright men strive to stem the tide, but in spite of all their efforts, the apostasy went on. Here's from the Christmas Almanac. As early as A.D. 245, the church father Origen was proclaiming it heathenish to celebrate Christ's birthday as if he were merely a temporal ruler when his spiritual nature, as in he's eternal, why, why celebrate a birthday, should be the main concern. The day was not even known to be Christ's birthday. It was merely an excuse to continue the customs of the pagan Saturnalia. From the Encyclopedia Britannica, the church fathers of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, such as Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and Epiphanius, contended that Christmas was a copy of pagan celebration. So some people tried to put the brakes on it, didn't work. From the book, the, Tr the Trouble with Christmas, to the early Christians, the idea of celebrating the birthday of a religious figure would have seemed at best peculiar and at worst blasphemous. Being born into this world was nothing to celebrate. What mattered was leaving this world and entering the next in a condition pleasing to God. You know, we celebrate the Passover, right? But we don't celebrate Christ's birth. When early Christians associated a feast day with a specific person, such as a bishop or a martyr, it was usually the date of the person's death. If you wanted to search the New Testament world for peoples who attached significance to birthdays, your search would quickly narrow to pagans. The Romans celebrated the birthdays of the Caesar. I mean, it was a mandated holiday. And most unchristian Mediterranean religions attached importance to the birth feast of a pantheon of their supernatural figures, of their gods. If Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem and his purpose in coming was anything like what is supposed, that is, he is the only god, king, potentate, to be of the world, then in celebrating his birthday each year, Christians do violence, not honor to his memory, because it would just place him, oh yeah, we'll celebrate his birthday, just like we celebrate Caesar's birthday, just like we celebrate this birthday and that birthday and that birthday and that birthday, and we'll all have a holiday in each of these things. And... <clears throat> all right, from the, from the book, The Story of Santa Claus, we remember that the Christmas festival is a gradual evolution from times that long antedated the Christian period. It was overlaid upon heathen festivals, as many of its observances are only adapt adaptations of pagan to Christian ceremonial. It was on or about December 21st that the ancient Greeks celebrated what are known to us as the Bacchanalia, or festivals in honor of Bacchus, the god of wine. In these festiv festivities, the people gave themselves up to songs, dances, and other revels, which frequently passed the limits of decency and order. Later, the Roman Saturnalia festival, in honor of Saturn, the god of time, began on December 17th and continued for seven days, and it was basically the same thing. Also ended in riot and disorder. All right, and that just goes on and on. I've got another page, another page. Another page.
another page. There is a mountain of evidence. But like I said before, it was, it was slower in getting adopted in some places than in others. It had gotten in in the 200s in Rome, but at least in the, the eastern part in Turkey, here's um, from the two Babylons. It says, the church father John Chrysostom, writing in Antioch about 380, says, it is not yet 10 years since this day was made, no made known to us. Among those inhabiting the West, it was known before from ancient and primitive times, and to dwellers from Thrace, that's Greece, to Gadira, that is in Spain, it was previously familiar and well known. That is the birthday of our Lord, which was unknown in Antioch in the East, on the very borders of the Holy Land. So he's kind of being sarcastic, like, well, they've known about it for thousands of years, it seems, but here we are, and... You know, Jesus was born only a couple hundred miles from here, and we've never heard anything about it. All right. But even there, eventually, it gets spread um, to the point where even once the Catholic Church is up and running, that even the Pope will specifically command the, um, the missionaries to go out and adopt pagan festivals like, Christ like Christmas um, to get more converts. Here's from the story of Santa Claus. Thus we find that when Pope Gregory sent St. Augustine as a missionary to convert Anglo-Saxon England, he directed that so far as possible the saint should accommodate the new and strange Christian rites to the heathen ones with which the natives had been familiar from their birth. He advised St. Augustine to allow his converts on certain festivals to eat and kill a great number of oxen to the glory of God the Father, as formerly they had done this in honor of their gods. I wonder if there's a scripture that says anything about whether God's people should worship him. And Yeah, <laughs> I think there is. Uh, God doesn't want that. So we see that from the time of the apostles, they knew this was going to happen. And they said, you want to keep to the message that was delivered. And so they kept the, the Sabbath. They kept the holy days. They did not keep things like Christmas. And... These things were just like layered on and on. And another trend that went hand in hand, and this is where I'll get to the Trinity, was not only were they taking the festivals like Christmas from these pagans, but they were also taking the very like philosophy and worldview itself. And that, all, that culminated in not just, well, you, you know, you can keep Christmas as great or not, but literally, if you don't accept the Trinity, you are not a Christian and we're going to excommunicate you. So we'll take a few minutes to look at that as well. From the book Reasonable, Reasonable Belief, a survey of the Christian faith, quote, the adoption of the Trinity doctrine came as a result of a process of theological exploration which lasted at, le at least 300 years. In fact, it was a process of trial and error, almost of hit and miss, in which the error was by no means all confined to the unorthodox. It would be foolish to represent the doctrine of the Holy Trinity as having been achieved in any other way. This was a long, confused process whereby different schools of thought in the church worked out for themselves and then tried to impose on others their answer to the question, how divine is Jesus Christ? If ever there was a controversy decided by the method of trial and error, it was this one. Of course, we all know, you know, we, you've read the Bible, right? Is, does it say anything about the Trinity? Does it say anything about three and one, one and three? Of course it doesn't. And again, I've got quote after quote after quote here that's saying that this concept and those words are nowhere in the Bible. You know, historians, theologians, many, if they're honest, they'll, they'll recognize that. But how did it get there then? Here's from the, it was called the Cyclopedia of B Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. It says, toward the end of the first and, second, and during the second century, many learned men came over both from Judaism and paganism to Christianity. These brought with them into the Christian school of theology their Platonic ideas and phraseology. Platonic, so Plato. Who was Plato? You might remember um, Socrates was supposed to be the wisest of all the ancient of the Greek philosophers. Well, Socrates, his most famous student was Plato. And Plato, his most famous student, was Aristotle. 
And Aristotle, his most famous student was Alexander the Great, who conquered, uh, you know, kind of the known world, conquered uh, Persia and all the way up to India, conquered, you know, Greece, Rome. Uh, well, not Rome, but uh, actually he was going to turn and go west and do Rome, and that's when he died. But anyway. Um, where was I? All right, here's from a book called God in Three Persons. The Trinity is not present in biblical thought, but arose when biblical thought was pressed into this foreign mold of Greek concepts. Thus, the doctrine of the Trinity goes beyond and even distorts what the Bible says about God. So what did Plato, this whole Platonic idea, what did he say? Well, way back in the 4th century, this is from the book Paganism in Our Christianity, in the 4th century B.C., so 400 years before Christ was born, Aristotle, the student of Plato, wrote, All things are three, and thrice is all, and let us use this number in the worship of the gods. For as the Pythagoreans say, everything and all things are bounded by threes. For the end and the middle and the beginning have this number in everything, and these compose the number of the Trinity." And they literally used the word. It says, uh, here's from the UCG booklet, Is God a Trinity? Later Greek thinkers refined Plato's concepts into what they referred to as three substances, the supreme God or the one, from which came mind or thought, and a spirit or soul. In their thinking, all were different divine substances or aspects of the same God. Another way of expressing this was good, the personification of that good, and the agent by which that good is carried out. Again, these were different divine aspects of the same supreme God, distinct and yet unified as one. Here's from a book called The History of Early Christianity. It says, it is now a popular theory that Gnosticism, so this idea of secret knowledge, penetrated and in some aspects created Catholicism, a little truth underlies this theory. It was a Greek spirit which endeavored to appro appropriate Christianity. From this system, the fathers of the church slowly selected such elements as enabled the Christian to accept as an intellectual conviction what he had already accepted as a spiritual revelation. So they're rationalizing what they already think. They're Greek philosophers, and they've had this philosophy for 600 years now, and so now they're just rationalizing what they already think and how that must fit on God and on Christ. Right. So this, these are all things just swirling around. Like I said, some of the churches were teaching these things. Some areas weren't teaching these things. So how did it get concretized? Well, it all come, started to coalesce because the Roman Emperor Constantine decided to convert to Christianity um, in the 300s. And I'll read uh, a quote from the, Will the Real Heretics Please Stand Up? He says, Constantine's subsequent relationship, so after he converts and says, hey, I'm a Christian too, to the church can only be understood in light of the relationship that Roman emperors had always had with the religion of their subjects. The Romans were basically a religious people, and they attributed their success and prosperity as an empire to the gods who had blessed them. Religion in the Roman Empire was a public matter. The religion and state had always been closely intertwined. Invocations and sacrifices were made to the gods during public ceremonies, and public worship of the gods was considered a matter of patriotic duty. Constantine did not require everyone in the empire to become a Christian. He simply gave Christianity legal recognition for the first time. Nevertheless, Christianity was now the religion of the emperor himself, which gave it prestige over all the pagan religions. So at that point, anyone who's anyone, oh, I'm also converting to Christianity. And it says he began paying the salaries out of the state treasury of the leaders of most of the churches, passed laws that exempted them from state service, promoted Christians to positions of prominence uh, in the state, surrounded himself with Christian advisors, and even sent bishops to accompany his troops into battle. It goes on to say, for two and a half centuries, Christians had remained relatively unchanged. Well, but in the... Um, 
But after Constantine's conversion, the church began to re-examine their attitude that change was necessarily wrong. When Constantine offered salaries to the church leaders, they reconsidered the matter and decided to accept them. The church began proclaiming that a new age had dawned for Christianity, and the old ways of doing things no longer had to be followed. Christians told themselves the God, that God changed the rules. Um, he goes on to say, uh, even that um, that it was almost like Constantine was a celebrity, and they were star stuck children, and oh wow, you know, the emperor likes us now. The problem with that is that for Constantine didn't actually convert. Um, again, you can find multiple sources on that. Uh, that Constantine uh, actually, one book says, his conversion should not be interpreted as an inward experience. It was a military matter, and his comprehension of doctrine was never very clear. Now, despite that, though, so he's a new convert, he doesn't really understand things, but when a controversy arises, he convenes a council, and he's going to chair it himself. It says, Constantine himself chaired the two-month-long conference and actively participated in the discussions. He soon impressed the church leaders with his leadership abilities and persuaded the group to draw up a church-wide creed that specifically addressed the divine nature of the Son. Constantine himself proposed the wording of the new church-wide creed, and as a result, all but five of the church representatives eventually signed it. Another source I said said all but two of them signed it. But it didn't work because there was no central authority, even though he was the emperor, and every place still kept teaching what they were going to teach. Anyway, so 60 years later, they convene another big conference in Constantinople. This is in 381. And they're going to sit down once and for all, what is the nature of God, and anyone who won't abide by that is going to be labeled a heretic. This is from the Is it God a Trinity booklet. He says, this council proposed an idea that was a step beyond what was given at the previous one, that God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit were co-equal and together in one being, yet also distinct from one another. These men were all trained in Greek philosophy, which no doubt affected their outlook and belief. In the year 381, 44 years after Constantine's death, Emperor Theodosius the Great convened the Council of Constantinople to resolve these disputes. One Gregory of Nazianzus, recently appointed as Archbishop of Constantinople, presided over the council and urged the adoption of his view of the Holy Spirit. And let's, I've got a quote, I've got a couple quotes from this guy who came up with the idea of the three and one and one and three, and they're all separate, but they're all the same. And these are what he himself said. He said, the Old Testament proclaimed the Father openly and the Son more obscurely. The New Testament manifested the Son and suggested the, de the deity of the Spirit, for it was not safe when the Godhood of the Father was not yet acknowledged to openly proclaim the Son, nor when the Godhood of the Son was yet achieved to burden us further with the Holy Spirit. He's like, so... So I know it doesn't say it, but that's because the early Christians weren't ready for it yet. But we are now. Again, here's another quote from him. He says, of his own idea, No sooner do I conceive of the one than I am illumined by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish three than I am carried back into the one. When I think of any of the three, I think of him as the whole, and my eyes are filled with the greatest part of what I am thinking of escapes me. So even he said it was confusing to himself. And uh, uh, the author of a book called The uh, History of God says, The Trinity only made sense in a mystical or spiritual experience. It was not supposed to be logical or intellectual, but an imaginative paradigm that confounded reason. And so that's... Basically, and you, you can 
hear this argument from Christians now. They're saying, well, that proves how right it is because it's so confusing. And the more you're confused by it, the more it proves that it's right. Okay. Anyway, uh, again from the church's Is God a Trinity booklet. Many of the church leaders who formulated the doctrine of the Trinity were steeped in Greek and Platonic philosophy, and this influenced their religious views and teachings. The language they used in describing and defining the Trinity is in fact taken directly from Platonic and Greek philosophy. The word Trinity itself is neither biblical nor Christian, but it is Latinized Trinitas from the Greek word trias. So it's literally, they took a term that was already in use for 600 years, or no, for 700 plus years, and just said, this defines God too. All right, just a couple more, and uh, I'll be done here. From the book History of Christianity, if paganism was conquered by Christianity, it is equally true that Christianity was corrupted by paganism. The pure deism of the first Christians was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. Many of the pagan tenets invented by the Egyptians and idealized by Plato were retained for being worthy of belief. Hey, okay, so that's it for the information dump there. Again, I'm sorry if I put you to sleep. Gave you flashbacks to school. Um, let's just read a couple scriptures and then we'll, you know, re real revealed knowledge. If you want, if you maybe you're still there in, in 1 John 2.24, we want to look at that again. He says, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, not 300 years later, not layer upon layer, but he says, if you heard from the begin, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will have the Son and the Father. Notice no Holy Spirit, no mention of the Holy Spirit as a divine entity. The message given at the beginning is found in your Bible. You don't need the things that were developed hundreds of years later and added to it. If it's not there, we don't make it a doctrine. I mean, everyone has customs and traditions, you know, neckties are a custom. These didn't exist in ancient Rome. We wear them, it's fine. The 4th of July, it's a national holiday, you know. It's not a religious thing like Christmas or the Trinity. But both of those, as we have seen over and over, <laughs> you would be surprised at how many of the things I skipped and am still going too long. Um, Anyway, let's go ahead and turn to one last scripture. Go ahead and go to 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 14. Here Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. And Corinth was a very pagan city, just like Rome, just like Alexandria and Egypt, and many of the big metropolitan areas where Christianity would spread to and eventually be polluted, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. And he tells them specifically, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for you are the temple of the living God. Just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. You know, don't learn the Greek philosophy. Don't learn the pagan gods. Don't learn the Babylonian mystery religion. Do not touch what is unclean, and then I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So again, I know you probably heard all that stuff before, but it's nice to know that if you're doubting at all, that there is just so, so, so much information that proves what we believe about, you know, the pagan organ origins of things like Christmas, and that applies for lots of other things, and the development of the Trinity, and that's not biblical at all, 
And again, if, if you want all that stuff, including all the things I didn't read, let me know and I can email you my whole entire list of, you know, two dozen pages or whatever it is. All right.